This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of the Resilient Life podcast. I am very excited for today's guest, my good friend, Zach Iskell. I'm going to keep his bio brief. He is a veteran, entrepreneur, philanthropist, and now candidate for mayor in New York City. I'm really excited to dive into some awesome conversation today, and I'm so thankful to him for giving us a little bit of his time during a busy season. Zach, welcome to the Resilient Life Podcast. Thank you for having me, Madam Mayor. Ryan, it's great to be here. <laughs> um, you know, I wouldn't miss this. Uh, one of the things that you, when you start running for office, I mean, you see this just throughout life in general. You, like, there's certain people who show up. Your family always shows up for this community, for the people in this community. Thank you for having me on today. And um, thanks for all the incredible work that, that you do for veterans in particular. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I was, uh, I always like start to think when I have guests on, like, how did I first meet this person? How did we connect? And I actually remember the first time that, I, that you and I met, it was at an event in New York City. It was the Vows event. And I remember yep. we were standing in, uh, there was a group of people standing around and I, I knew your name because the Marine Corps is so small. Um, and so you just kind of hear different Marines names and I, yeah. the name Zach Iskell, but you were talking in, in, we were in a group of Usually people. followed by some sort of expletive, but I'll take it. No, not at all. But, <laughs> but someone said, oh, this is Zach Iskell. And I remember I was like, oh, hi, Zach. Nice to meet you. I'm Ryan Mannion. And again, because the Marine Corps is a small community, you knew who I was and, um, of and we started talking and I was just... I remember the first time I met you, you were just such a genuine person. And I felt like a deep connection with you because of the Marine Corps, because of your commitment to service. And um, I was a big fan of you from the beginning. And your you. path in the Marine Corps, um, I was actually talking to one of our mutual friends, Carlo Pacori, last night around when you were in the Marine Corps. And I think you actually got out of the Marine Corps right before... Travis and a bunch of our mutual friends from First Recon deployed to Iraq. So you were there, you graduated from Cornell mm -hmm. in 2001, then joined yep. the Marine Corps, and you were there for the second battle of Fallujah uh, in Iraq, which was a, a yep. monumental event. Tell us a little bit about your path into service and how that came to be. Yeah. So, I mean, I think uh, it's a great question. My... Um, I don't come from sort of like a traditional military family, but almost everybody in my family served. Um, actually, you know, behind me, I have a photo of my great uncle's uh, B-17 bomber crew. Uh, he was killed in World War II. And I remember hearing stories about him from my grandmother, his, his sister growing up. And my parents had this, um, my earliest memory about wanting to join the military, my parents had this dresser in their bedroom in the middle drawer at the top. I wasn't allowed to go into it. And of course, what does a kid do when you're not allowed to go into something? You go into it. It was filled with family heirlooms. And one of the heirlooms um, was a set of dog tags. And it was, it, was, it was dog tags for all the members of my family who had served. My dad's dog tags, his father's, his stepfather's. Um, and I remember at that early age just wanting to add my dog tag to that chain. Um, and I think that's where it started. I then, at Cornell, I played lightweight football. Um, which is a varsity sport, but for guys who are a little bit smaller. And uh, my football coach there was a guy named Terry Cullen, who was a Silver Star recipient from, from Vietnam, uh, had served in the Marine Corps. Uh, I think he was in 1-9 and uh, Walking Dead. And he really encouraged me to join the military, or the Marine Corps in particular, as opposed to the other branches. And, you know, it, it's funny. I... I I've had conversations. I actually had a conversation with someone um, just recently around this. And, you know, you said you, you, 
you're not someone who traditionally would have joined the service. And we get that a lot. You know, my dad was a um, retired colonel in the Marine Corps, but I'll never forget when uh, the news showed up to my parents' house after Travis was killed. There was one reporter in particular who walked into mm-hmm. my parents' living room. And the first thing he said was, I never, uh, oh, wow, I didn't realize that people who grew up in houses like this joined the military. And it was just this really awakening for us as a family that there was this huge misnomer about men and yeah. women who choose a life of service, that that there's a stigma around this idea that it is just disadvantaged youth who have no other options. And it's just like, well, join the military. And I think, you know, you you probably, I, I'm, I imagine that there are people in your life that were probably saying you're joining the military. Did you get that at all? I did. I actually, um, I actually remember I was on a plane. I, I did a semester in DC and I was flying back from Washington DC to Ithaca where Cornell was. And I ran into a professor and he asked me what I was doing after graduation. I said, I'm joining the Marine Corps. And I'll never forget. He asked me like, what are you doing wasting your Cornell education going into the Marines? But for the most part, um, you know, I found that most people were very supportive. And I mean, even the president of Cornell University, Hunter Rawlings, his son is, I think, now a colonel in the Marine Corps. Um, Cornell has a, a one of the largest ROTC programs in the country. And I, but I do think you're right. There is sort of this fundamental misunderstanding as to why people join. I mean, there's this amazing statistic that less than 24 percent of young Americans are eligible to join the military because they're not smart enough, educated enough, fit enough, intelligent enough. They might have a criminal record, a history of drug use. So it's really just the top 24% that are eligible to join. And then, as you know, it's like 1% that actually chooses to put their right hand in the air and actually step forward and do it. Yep. So you come back, you leave the military, you leave active duty in 2007, but then you actually return to Iraq to film a documentary called The Western Front. Yeah. Tell us about the decision to do that, to say, I'm going to go back and I want to, what was it that drew you to wanting to tell a story about your time there and what was happening on the ground there? Yeah. So it was, you know, when I was there in 04, 16 years ago, I mean, we were, it was highly kinetic. The second battle of Fallujah was more than highly kinetic. Um, but in 2006, 2007, even into 2008, you had the Al Anbar awakening. You know, essentially Marines in particular learned that the path to peace wasn't about being quick to the trigger. It was really about building partnerships, uh, relationships, understanding that some of the folks we've been fighting against had legitimate grievances. And maybe by reaching out to them, we could reduce the number of people that we needed to fight and, and build those alliances. I also, um, one of the uh, the, Sort of, sort of one of my, the, the best opportunities I had in the Marine Corps is when we were building MARSOC, uh, my commanding officer sent me on this uh, tour of the Middle East and Africa where I basically went around and embedded with special operations in order to sort of figure out what MARSOC should look like. And I came back and, and wrote this report on it. And, you know, when you're spending time downrange, you realize that warfare had fundamentally changed over the last few years. And that what was needed downrange more than forces that had kinetic and conventional abilities, it was really people who were able to build partnerships, alliances um, on the ground. And I didn't want that lesson to be lost. You know, I wanted to make sure that the, that the next time we go to war, that that those hard-earned lessons that cost a lot of blood to to, to learn. Um, that we weren't forgotten. And so that was really the impetus for me going back to Iraq as a filmmaker in, in 2008, nine and, and 10. I think it's so interesting that you frame it that way because um, I, I would say that one of the things I know for my family that we're most proud of in what Travis did as a Marine is not the, you know, quote unquote, war fighter, uh, things that people talk about Travis as a silver star yeah. recipient, the, the actions on his last day. I mean, the, the proudest moment for my family was when we had a video sent back and, and they shared this story in Iraq of, cause Travis was embedded with the Iraqi army, helping to train and lead them. And um, 
they talked about the memorial they had in Iraq for him, the Marines, and they said it was this um, really jaw-dropping moment where they were holding the memorial and out of nowhere, the doors busted open and all of these Iraqi service members started walking in. Yeah. And at first, the colonel um, that was there said, at first they got really nervous, like, wait, what's happening? And the Iraqi colonel walked up to the podium with a translator and shared this story about Travis, how he did such an incredible job of bringing the two forces together. And so, yeah. you know, I think of the fact that my brother was a Marine, but he was also a humanitarian. And I think he understood the importance, like you said, of these partnerships, of reaching out, of creating these alliances. And, um, you know, I never got a chance to well, talk with him about that, but I know that was important yeah. what he was doing. Well, he was, um, I mean, you know, you talk about, you know, when the first time we met, I mean, I had known who your family was. I had known about your brother for years um, just because of his his reputation and because of the type of leader that he was, both at the Naval Academy, in service. Uh, he was one of those guys who you heard about his name, and it was because of that that character, that personality, that ability to sort of transcend cultures and language barriers, um, you know, as you said, even more so than his heroics in combat. Yeah, absolutely. So what I love about what you have done and the path that you have created through your life is that you came back and um, it's actually funny because while I know you very well, of course, I did a bunch of research to, to and read a yeah. bunch of articles about you leading into this conversation. And I found something that was very similar in our approach to uh, the, the service uh, that we um, that we have had through the military community. And you talked about you um, were the co-founder of an amazing organization, Headstrong. And I want yep. you to talk a little bit about that. But one of the things that you said, and Headstrong is around, around you know, providing mental health resources, but you said something very interesting. And it was something that my mom said the same thing after Travis was killed. After Travis was killed, you know, not only did we have the Keiko officer show up at the door who served at the Naval or went to the Naval Academy with Travis. So they brought a friend to the, our front door along with yeah. the Lieutenant Colonel that served with my dad. And we realized that, you know, the widow in Kansas city that gets the knock on her door from a Marine who she doesn't know before we had opportunities to guide us through the process that probably everybody yeah. didn't get. And my mom said, I want to make sure that nobody feels this sense of isolation when they lose their loved one, that they feel as supported as we did when going through the process. And you said something similar in a news or an article that I had read about you. You said, listen, I know that had I come back and dealt with PTSD and dealt with mental health issues, I would have been able to receive the right support. I would have been cared for. I would have been taken care of. Uh, but you took that as an impotence to say, and I want to make sure that everybody else is. So tell us a little bit about the birth of Headstrong and what they do and um, and how critical they are right now to our service members. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's I mean, it's so core to the Travis Mannion Foundation, right? It's that you you have to give meaning to sacrifice. In fact, when I was making my film, I had an opportunity to interview a, a noted psychiatrist, uh, um, uh, name, uh, I got his name right now. Um, but, uh, Dr. Robert Lifkin, uh, who is a professor at Harvard has he's in his late eighties now, might even be in his nineties. And uh, one of the things that he did is he studied Hiroshima survivors, Holocaust survivors, and also just combat veterans. And he realized that a lot of them had to give meaning to their experiences. It was what he called survivor's meaning, you know, that you have survivor's guilt, we also have survivor's meaning. What do you do with those experiences to sort of justify the fact that you made it home? And um, so for me, part of Headstrong has been giving meaning to my experiences, um, but it was also that I came from a lineage of Marine officers, um, you know, guys like my battalion commander, Colonel Willie Buell, you know, General John Tulin, uh, General Dunford, that, uh, you know, down to a, you know, remarkable captain, I had an infantry officer course named John Maloney. And their fundamental belief was that as a Marine officer, your job is to take care of your people. 
And that is more important than the mission. You take care of your people, they will accomplish the mission. And that you don't, that responsibility doesn't go away when you turn over command or when you take off your uniform. And so in 2011, I was having drinks with my battalion commander, Colonel Buell. Um, we'd had a spate of suicides in our battalion. We just had a really bad one where a young sergeant came home, kissed his wife and kids at the dinner table, went upstairs, they heard the gunshot. And Colonel Buell just looked at me and he said, we need to do something. And I didn't know the first thing about mental health care. I knew that when I came home, I'd struggled with sleepless nights, anxiety, survivor's guilt. Um, I did end up talking to some folks and, and getting the help that I needed. Um, but I didn't really know the first thing about mental health care, but I knew people who did. And so we formed a partnership with Cornell Medical Center here in New York City, uh, raised a small amount of money um, and started a program here in the city that the, the objective was we're gonna provide world-class treatment has to have zero bureaucracy because I've been struggling to get a lot of my Marines into the VA and navigating that bureaucracy was almost impossible. So it had to be zero bureaucracy, zero paperwork, uh, no barriers, so zero cost uh, to, to, for the veteran to be able to get the care they needed. Um, the most important, it had to be effective, right? The care had to work. And, um, and so we started that program in about 2011, 2012. I think our first patient was treated like September of 2011. Um, we've now grown that. We're in almost 30 cities around the United States. Uh, we are treating, I think right now, it's about 800 to 1,000 veterans a week are getting care through Headstrong. So it's turned into one of the leading and largest providers of mental health care in the country. And what we've learned is that if a veteran has the courage to get help and they step forward and they, they get the right help, you know, post-traumatic stress, unlike a lot of other mental illnesses, is treatable. You can recover from it. Um, what I've learned is that it's really just the inability to turn off the fight or flight response, um, which is really a survival mechanism. You know, when you think about the symptoms of PTSD, hypervigilance, sleeplessness, restlessness, anxiety, like those are all things that help you survive in dangerous situations, right? Anxiety and restlessness and hypervigilance, that's your body getting ready to react. And so those are things that make you good at combat, or if you're about to step onto the wrestling mat, or you're about to go, you know, play in a football game, you know, that anxiety is helpful. The problem is, is when you come home from war, you need to turn that off. And if you can't, that's what post-traumatic stress is. And that with the right treatment, you can turn that off in order to get back to being a, a good parent, you know, a good spouse, um, um, a good child, right? To your parents, um, whatever it may be. Absolutely. And what I love about Headstrong, and we are uh, at the Travis Manning Foundation's uh, incredible advocates for the work you do, uh, you know, refer a lot of our veterans there when yeah. they're struggling. And um, I love our partnership and the work that we do together. But I also love the, that how you've taken, you know, this taboo subject in terms of veteran mental health, and you've really done a great job in pushing away the stigma. And I think when I look at Headstrong and look at some of the campaigns you've done, you're taking these Marines and service members that are, are known, they're known within this community, yeah. and but they're not known for their struggles with mental health. And you're putting them in the forefront. And all of a sudden you're like, you, you, can, you can almost feel the wheels of these younger service members that are struggling. And they're like, wait, that person's dealing with mental health issues. And so I yeah. love the, the, the marketing campaign behind what you do at Headstrong because it's important. It's important not to just say, hey, it's here, come get free, no cost mental health services. Yeah. But also to say like, hey, I'm Zach Iskell and I got some help too, you know? And um, oh, oh wow. for sure. I think I fundamentally believe that the stigma associated with mental health and also just the, the and I don't like using this word, but the ignorance or lack of knowledge about what post-traumatic stress is has probably killed more veterans than post-traumatic stress itself, right? That, that if the, 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 the lack of willingness of veterans to step forward and get help, the lack of familiarity, um, you know, that like they get a lot of anxiety when they go out in public, you know, they get hypervigilant, but they seem to think like after one or two or three beers that goes away, they don't make the connection that that's called self-medicate, that alcohol is subduing the symptoms and, that that's a dangerous spiral. And it's just like providing that, that framework and that education and familiarity. It's so important to, to overcoming this disease. Incredibly important. And again, you guys do incredible work. 
uh, through Headstrong and helping to combat that. So, okay, let's let's switch gears a bit. And um, of course, we we need to talk about COVID nineteen. And um, you know, COVID hits, and there's yeah. a lot going on. You know, us as an organization at the Travis Manion Foundation, we had to shift real quickly to bring are mostly face-to-face programming into a virtual environment. And um, I will not forget, I was sitting there and I'm scrolling through, I don't know, Facebook or Twitter, and I see a news article and there's uh, the deputy director of the Javits Hospital in New York City (laughs) running operations during COVID and there's Zach Iskell. And you uh, worked to create a makeshift hospital uh, to house COVID patients. Um, yep. So again, a problem exists and you dive right into it. Tell us a little bit about that experience and um, and why you felt it was important to kind of step forward during the, the pandemic. I mean, it, it's, it, again, it comes back to like the ethos of the Travis Manion Foundation, right? If not me, then who? And, you know, at the height of this, this pandemic, um, I was losing my mind, not being able to help. The hospitals were getting overrun. I knew doctors and nurses that were on the front line uh, fighting. Um, I ended up working with a group of other business leaders uh, to help source um, equipment and supplies for hospitals. It's all pro bono. Everything we sourced was done as a donation. There was never any money exchanging hands. And I helped get, I think it was like 3,000 or 5,000 N95 masks for Brooklyn Hospital. And one of the doctors there who worked in the emergency room called me to thank me. And I, I just asked her how it was going. You could hear in her voice that it wasn't. Uh, she had a, she was a single mom. Uh, this was around March 24th, 25th. My son's six year old, six uh, year birthday was on March 25th. And so it was right around then. And she hadn't seen her daughter since March 8th because of she had been working, treating COVID patients, didn't want to expose her daughter. And again, she's a single mom. And um, for some reason, like, you know, I've been deployed, I've deployed with people who have been away from their families, but this was just different. Like imagine like going into work on March 8th, you know, saying goodbye to your daughter and then your daughter's four years old and doesn't understand why you're not seeing her at the end of the day, right? Why is she not? And I just, um, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I had a really good friend from the Marine Corps uh, who is helping run state operations uh, for the response, a guy named Pete Karanen. So I reached out to Pete and I just said, what can I do to help? Uh, He put me in touch with some other folks in the governor's office. And I ended up going to Javits Medical Center as a volunteer. And, you know, when I, when I arrived there, it was a very familiar environment, right? It was a task force environment, but I think we had 28 federal, state and city agencies working there. And when I walked in, I just saw like, nobody was talking to each other. Everybody was siloed in their own little sort of pods. And um, and then also we didn't really even have the the capacity to treat COVID pa- to treat patients there. We weren't even allowed to treat COVID patients at this point. But Javits initially was set up um, with about 2,000 beds. Uh, it was something called a federal medical shelter, which is a FEMA construct used to house people during hurricanes and earthquakes. But it's not a hospital. And um, you know, so I ended up calling a meeting with some of the smartest doctors, some of the heads of these meetings. And I just, what can we do here to be helpful? We have all these resources, all this capability, just what can we do to be helpful in it? There was a number of things that iteratively we sort of started to develop, but ultimately it came down to, we need to start treating COVID patients here if we're going to be helpful. So that led to the process of us getting permission to treat COVID patients from Albany, from Washington, uh, and then we had to build a COVID hospital, and the team there did that in about five days. ICU beds, oxygen, pulse oximetry, pharmacy. Uh, it was remarkable. And um, we ended up treating almost 1,100 New Yorkers. Uh, you know, there were moments there that were incredibly frustrating working with the bureaucracy, um, but also like the people inside that building, um, they were all there for the right reason. I like even no matter who they were working for, no matter who their boss was outside the building, the people inside that building, whether they were from the city, the state, the federal government, the U.S. military, they were all there because they wanted to try and help New Yorkers in one of their greatest times of need. And um, I like to think that we stepped up, we turned the place around and, and did that. I just I think it's incredible. And I was I was so proud to see you um, 
step Thank up you. in that role. And especially, you know, listen, New York has been, again, ground zero for another yeah. national um, emergency. And all eyes have been on particularly New York City during this pandemic. And, you know, here we are now, we're in wave two of COVID. Um, right. And it's like, I think at this point, it's it's almost a little bit, it's almost a little bit harder because you look at it from, I remember in March when everything kind of kicked off, I kept saying like, oh, the kids are out of school. Okay, well, all right, well, we're going to get some stuff done around here. The kids will be out for a couple of weeks. We're going to work <laughs> through this. And, yeah. then it, and then it just kept going and going. And then you started to see this little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel. And you'd hear these things in the back of your head, like it's going to get worse when the weather gets cold around the holidays. And here it is. And here we are. But now you're also looking at the economic toll that it's taking. You're looking at the mental toll it's taking um, along with the the toll of those that are losing their lives to this pandemic. So there's so yeah. many elements to this whole thing. But particularly in New York, you know, there is a... a Cuomo just met with um, uh, a bunch of uh, neighboring states and, you know, they're closing restaurants again. And, um, you know, th- talk to us a little bit outside of the pandemic itself, but like the challenges that this pandemic has placed on businesses and local economies, especially in New York, you hear, you hear these things like New York is dead. You know, the, 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 it's not the yeah. city it used to be. What are you seeing? So I think I think New York will roar back to life. I think New York wants to roar back to life. I think there is huge demand for a place like New York City. Um, you know, there's huge demand for art, our culture, our restaurants, for living in a city as vibrant, as energetic as New York City. Um, but I think this winter is going to be brutal. And I think one of the things that's just heartbreaking to me is, um, you know, our city government in particular is completely broken. Um, It is reactive, not proactive. Uh, It is placing all of the burden of this disease on small businesses, on workers. It's not taking on on school children. You know, it's not taking on any of the burdens itself. You know, and I think that there's there's so many things that the city could be doing to move mountains, right, to help support small businesses and restaurants, to help keep schools open so that, you know, kids are able to keep getting an education and their parents can keep working. And it's not doing any of that stuff. Instead, the, the entire response is social distance, wear a mask. And there needs to be greater government effort in that. I mean, you've got, you look at some places in Asia, whether it's Taiwan, um, you know, Seoul, even in Wuhan in China, they are proactively testing their cities. Wuhan, they tested 6.5 million people in 10 days. Right here, it's like we have to wait seven hours to get a test. You know, I mean, it's it just it's night and day in terms of the level of competence. Um, you know, so I am I think that the bigger issue than the disease is there's this fundamental lack of competency, will um, amongst our city leaders uh, that are making this much more difficult than it can be. And, and so you see that, especially with restaurants, you talk to a lot of restaurant owners. New York City has now lost a third of its restaurants. We're in danger of losing half to two thirds of our restaurants by the end of the year. And you talk to restaurant owners and it's like the hardest thing for them to deal with is often the city itself. You know, the city's coming in and fining them at a time when, you know, they're barely making money. The city is not clear about what the rules are for outdoor dining. Um, You've got multiple agencies that are inspecting them. So, you know, I've got a friend who, he set up outdoor dining on the street. It was, you know, where he was allowed to set up outdoor dining. The Department of Buildings came and said, you need to put a ramp in, you know, so that, so that diners can get down, um, you know, to the street level. He then had the Department of Transportation come and say, no, no, you've got to remove the ramp because it's in a no standing zone. And it's just like, you, can we just get on the same page? Um, and that, uh, that bureaucracy, the fining, the fees. I mean, if, if you install a new HVAC system in your restaurant in order to become compliant and you know provide a safer workplace for your employees, for your guests, you have to fill out a filing fee for the city. You have to pay the city 500,000 bucks. 
we need to keep every dollar possible in city's pockets. I've got a friend of mine who's actually a former Marine. He's built huge business in the city, six bars. One of his bars was doing $100,000 a week this time last year. It's now doing 5,000 if he's lucky. And so I asked him, I was like, Pete, how are you staying in business? And he said, well, my bank came to me and they said, uh, you know, no interest payments for the next six months. We're just going to extend your loan another six months on the back end. He had his suppliers taken from 30 or 60 day payables to 90 to 120. He had his landlord say, you can pay half month, half month's rent for the next six months, and then we'll amortize it across future rent payments. But when city taxes were due in June, he had to pay two, three hundred thousand dollars in city taxes. He had to lay people off because of that. And so, you know, I understand the city needs to take in revenues, but if those businesses close, where are those revenues going to come next year or the year after or the year after? It's just so short sighted. And we unfortunately, you know, New York City right now, I think far worse than the disease. We've got, you know, a mayor who's asleep at the wheel for I think about another 400 days. And I think that that lack of leadership can do a lot more damage in that period of time. I I am weary to ever, you know, as an elected official, I know the challenges of yeah. living and um, listen, I've got 20,000 people uh, in, in my district. I, I certainly don't have New York City. So I'm always weary to criticize anyone um, in a leadership role, um, especially in times of crisis, because it's tough. Um, but I, I have never looked at a situation like I look at New York City right now and the mayor and think of more failed leadership than what's happening. I mean, it is, it's unbelievable. And I think yeah. it, again, because there is such a limelight on New York City uh, for this pandemic as a whole, this, it's a trickle down effect to the rest of the country. And it creates this, you know, again, it's, we're talking about cause and effect here. And we have a, a very deadly disease that's out there, but there are secondary effects that are just forgotten about that, you yep. know, again, there, there's, there are some, some things that Trump has said along this, the course of this pandemic. And, you know, he's talked about is the, the, is the effects of what's happening worse than the disease itself. And in some ways I understand that concept where you're, you're, nobody's looking to these small business owners and looking at these secondary effects that are going to happen. And this isn't to say, take off the mask and everybody, but there are solutions right. here. There are solutions. Oh, there here. are. I mean, you see it. Um, you know, one of the things I hear from people all over the city, because even in this time of COVID, like whether it's on Zoom or whether you're actually like going and meeting people, socially distanced, masks on, um, but one of the best parts about running for mayor is, is you get to meet with people all over the city. It's also one of the most heartbreaking. And one of the things I hear in almost every single community, right, whether it's, it's the South Bronx, East New York, Brownsville, you know, uh, all over Manhattan, Queens, Jackson Heights. One of the things I keep hearing people say to me when I ask them how they're doing is, and you can also just see it on their faces, people are having trouble sleeping at night, right? And like, if you think about, you know, this issue with, getting kids back in school. We know schools are now, we now know schools are a safe place to be. We didn't know that in March. We know that now, right? We know schools are safer than almost any other place in the community, especially for young kids. We also know kids not being in school is going to have devastating long-term effects, right? Parents are trying to work and they're stressed out of their minds and being stretched thin. Kids are not learning socialization. They are way behind on, on their academics. Um, there's an, and we're not even talking about how we're going to catch kids up next year. We're not even going to, we're not even talking about how we're going to prepare kids, you know, so, to build the resiliency and the relationships and the routines that they can start learning to catch up next year. And, you know, we have a city that can't even do the, like the simple logistics stuff of opening up schools of getting 60,000 tablets in the hands of kids who don't have a way of online learning. How is this city going to do the complicated stuff? Right. I, I mean, up. Yeah, I saw a horrible video and it was actually from New York City and it was a high school student and she was sitting at a table and her little brother, who she was also, who was also virtual learning, 
was videotaping yeah. her because she wanted to show proof of, and again, this is a not a knock on New York City teachers. Yeah. They're doing God's work trying to teach virtually, yeah. but her internet kept cutting out. And the they were trying to show like she doesn't have good internet. So the internet kept cutting out, and her teacher was saying, You need to figure this out because this is the way it is, and you have to figure it out. And then she looked up and she goes, Who are you looking at? And she goes, Oh, my little brother. And she said, You need to be in a room by yourself in order to do this properly. And she said, But my brother's here by himself, and I have to make sure that he's doing his schoolwork. Yeah. Like all these challenges. But then I look at, you know, I have three kids. My two youngest kids are a part of the Archdiocese of Philadelphia. So they go to a small Catholic school. They have been in school full time since the beginning yeah. of September. My other daughter is virtual. Now, there has been more COVID cases, and they do like a hybrid model at the virtual school. There has been more COVID cases at my daughter's virtual slash hybrid school than there has at my younger kids' school where they go every single day. There's been like one COVID case and no spread yeah. with the school. So it can be done. But again, I don't know that we're looking for these solutions and we're looking to, it's it's all being given to us. Like, hey, schools are safe. So if we're, if we're following this idea of follow the science, schools are safe. So why aren't the kids in school? You know, and, and I know that was a- There's also no will. I mean, you know, when you think about like my great uncle's B-17, we were building- B-17, it took four days to build that plane in World War II. We moved mountains. Like, we could move mountains today, right? We just, there's no will to. Well, there's it's, no it, leadership to. Yeah, it's the, it's the easier way out. It's this idea of wear masks, stay six feet apart, and everybody stay inside until the yeah. vaccines are available. Well, that's not going to work. So, but you, again stepping up and deciding um, I'm not just going to sit here and watch what's happening in my great city and not be a part of the solution. You have decided that this year you are going to put your foot into the arena and run for New York City mayor. And again, I, you know, we've talked a little bit over uh, the last <laughs> several months, but I've been keeping up with you through um, news articles. And again, I get my dad is an avid reader of the New York Post. He gets that delivered <laughs> to his door every single day. And he texts me and says, did you see this? And, and it, it wasn't before. It was just this like tickler, I think, even in page six. And it was like, Zach yeah. is may or may not be running for mayor. And I was like, oh, please, <laughs> true. And I texted you and I'm like, is this true? And you were kind of like, well, stay tuned, you know? And I was like, okay, yes. <laughs> and I was so... I was so happy to see that you stepped into this arena, but again, um, it's a hard place to be. Um, and yeah. I think that, you know, in some ways, because of your upbringing, you know, politics is not foreign territory for you, but um, did you think this, this step into running for office, was it inevitable or was it really a sign of the times and you really seeing a need right now to say, this is, this is the time for me? Yeah, I've always um, I've always thought about running for office. I always thought it was something that was in my future. I've always, you know, a man can't live on bread alone. And I've always been committed to service in, in one way or another. Um, even, you know, in the businesses I built, largely have been B Corps, the nonprofit work that I've done, my time in the military. And I think this is a continuation of it. But if you had asked me a year ago if I'd be running for mayor of New York City, I would have thought you're out of your mind. We have, I have four kids, three dogs. I had three businesses, a nonprofit. I had my hands full with life. Um, but, you know, especially um, seeing just the dearth of leadership uh, from the front lines of Javits, seeing that, you know, New York City is unlike any other place in the world. New York City, uh, in terms of the resources available here, New York spends 90, $95 billion a year. It's more than 48 out of 50 states, almost as much as I think the next 12, 15, or even 20 largest US cities combined. And when you think about like those resources and that potential and how it's being wasted on potentially solving seemingly intractable problems, um, it was sort of a natural step out of some of the frustrations I had when we were turning around Javits Medical Center, in particular working with the city. And just seeing all of this potential, all of these resources. And then you see, you know, New York City is a town where, as wealthy as it is, one out of two New Yorkers has spent a year in poverty in the last four years. Um, 
you know, last year in 2019, we had more New Yorkers, including children, spending a night in a homeless shelter than at any point in time in New York's history. Um, you've got businesses that have been existing on razor thin margins. The cost of living here is absurd. Um, and I saw that there was a, um, I think it's because of our dysfunctional politics. I think it's because we need a new type of leadership. Um, and I saw the potential for what that type of leadership can do at Javits. And that, that sort of thought process is what led me to think that now is the time, now is a moment. Um, and I think the city and people in New York right now are ready for something different. You know, I think they are, they are very sick of the status quo of career politicians. We've seen where that has gotten us over the last six years. Um, you know, and I think we need something new to get us out of it. I think outside of New York City, I think that the country in large is sick of career politicians and yeah. is looking for a new type of leadership. And that is what I love about individuals like you that are stepping forward to say, thank you. Listen, I mean, just like you didn't have to join the Marine Corps, you, you've got a great life. You've got great businesses. You've got, you, you, there's, there's nothing in it for you other than this desire to serve. And the fact that frankly, you're going to bring ideas and leadership that the city has probably not seen for many, many, many years. So, um, Thank this you. is my um, this is my heartfelt endorsement of <laughs> your run for mayor. I am behind you one hundred percent. Thank you, Madam and, Mayor. Yes, and I think you're actually my, my first official political endorsement, and I it couldn't come from somebody better. So I'll oh, take it. Oh, there you go. I'll, there you go. Um, and you know, but I, I think you know, important for the listeners out there to understand that um, you know what happens in cities like you, New York. If you're not living in New York. It's important. It's important to make sure that our leadership is strong across this entire country. And that's yeah. why I'm always making sure that I can give a sound box to individuals that are stepping forward to serve and to serve for the right reasons. And um, it's very easy to sniff out people that are there to, to kind of check the box and say, now I'm going to run. Yeah. You know, this is what I did. Now I'm going to run. Um, there's no ego about you, Zach, but you are an incredible Thank leader. You and someone that um, I'm super excited to watch your journey and to be a part of it and support in any way. Um, all right, I'm going to let you go because I've taken too much of your time, but I wanna end our conversation with the same question I ask all of our guests. Uh, yeah. That is, what does living a resilient life look like for you? I think it really means to have the willingness to learn from your failures learn from your setbacks um, and giving meaning to them, you know, whether it's, whether it's a loss, whether it's um, um, something that you failed at, something that you did an accomplishment accomplish. I think the ability to sort of learn from those experiences and continue to move on uh, is, and not letting those things break you. Yeah. We've all failed in life. Um, some fails have been bigger. Failures have been bigger than others. Um, but for me, it's like, do you, do you learn lessons from those failures? You know, do they help you do better the next time? Um, you know, maybe I don't win this mayor's race. Maybe I get dragged through the mud, right? You know, for me, it's, I have something to say, um, and hopefully it will make me a better candidate next time. I think we also have a very good shot at winning. I'll say that right up front. I think that this is a, in a particular year where we do. But I think part of being resilient is um, and having a resilient life is is not being afraid to do the hard things, um, not being afraid to put yourself out there, um, whether it's asking somebody out on a date, um, whether it's enrolling in a class, whether it's starting a business or a new career. Um, you know, I mean, even like being a parent, I mean, I fail every day as a parent. You know. And and I've got and I'm on my fourth kid and I fail every day as a parent. But part of being resilient is like knowing that like, you know, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and like I'm not gonna put the diaper on backwards, you know, or you know, you can uh you can always do better tomorrow and you just need to keep waking up and having better tomorrow. I love that. And I wrote down something that you said earlier you when we were talking about um, you know, your your journey back leaving the military and you said survivor's meaning and giving meaning to 
the fact that you're still here and you said it again, you said giving meaning to your setbacks, giving meaning to your failures. And I think that's a really yeah. important lesson that all of us can take. You know, we're going to fail. Um, we're going to have setbacks. We're going to have challenges, each and every one of us. But um, I always say, if you don't take, if you don't try, you're not going to fail. And so you have to try to fail. And if you do fail, you have to put meaning to that failure. So I love yeah. that message. I think it's one that um, is important for our listeners to hear. Put meaning to your setbacks. That's how you live a resilient life. Zach Iskell, I hope that we can bring you back when you are the New York City mayor. And I can say welcome to the show. Be here. Mayor of New York, Zach Iskell. Uh, thank you. Can your for audience the keep a secret? Yes. I think absolutely. your audience keep a secret. All right. So we're, we're, we're inside the circle right now with your audience. One of the things that I want to do you know, the day of inauguration, which will be January 1st, 2022. I want to sneak into City Hall with a small group of Marines, and I want to raise the Marine Corps colors over City Hall. <laughs> oh, well, we have a pretty large military component on this podcast that listens, so I think we're probably going to get a lot of inquiries about being part of that small group of Marines that helps you raise. I'm going to put, I'm going to put Colonel Mannion, your dad, that old war horse is going to be on the selection committee. Send your application to Colonel Mannion. Okay. I'll let him know. I'll, <laughs> well, I'll share his email uh, at the end of the show. <laughs> Zach, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for your incredible leadership, not just in thank uniform, you. but outside of it and for all you continue to do. And um, we will um, we'll put a link to uh, some information about your campaign so people can look right. into it more and know where to find you and know where to donate and help you become the next mayor of New York City. Zach Iskell, thanks for joining us on The Resilient Life. Thank you, Ryan. It's great to see you. Give my love to the family.